If you have a copy of God's Word, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 and just two verses, verses 11 through 13. I know Dr. White is leading you through a study through Ephesians, and I was talking to him about this message. And I know back in October, you were in Ephesians 2. What I'm going to do today is look at these two verses and take it a different direction than how he handled this passage. Specifically, what I want to share with you is the most important discipline I learned in my 20s. The most important discipline I learned in my 20s. For that discipline proved and still proves to be the most life-giving, joy-fulfilling, God-glorifying, sin-destroying discipline in my life. And if it's something you can grasp onto now, while you're approaching or in your 20s, it will change your life. And it will allow you to honor the Lord. The world in which we're living these days can be discouraging. And uh, in part, we can be discouraged because of what's going on in our own heads. Uh, we have to live with ourselves. We know what we think during the times. We know what our struggles are. We know how we sin. And we wrestle with that. And then when we look into the world and the culture itself, we can be discouraged by that because we see what the world's struggling with and the temptations it's giving into and the sins that it exploits. Well, today I want to spend some time thinking about that battle inside of our minds, this internal struggle, and how to have victory over that. And tomorrow, we'll look at a different passage and talk about how Christians are to interact in this world, which can be a struggle as well. So internal today, external tomorrow. Ephesians 2, 11 through 13. Paul says, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, therefore remember that at what time, at what time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ." When I was in college, I lived in a dorm room, which surely is not as nice as the ones you have here. Uh, it was a small little cinder block room. We shared a bathroom, my roommate and I, with, with two other uh, suite mates. And I can remember to this day where I was when I first read through C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. I trusted Christ my freshman year in college, so my undergraduate experience was as much discipleship as it was, figuring out life as it was, discovering the sin patterns in my life and learning how to put them to death. And when I made my way through C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity and I came to chapter eight, which is called The Great Sin, I knew I had a major problem. The great sin, as C.S. Lewis describes it, is the sin of pride. He says, pride is the root of all other sins. And he begins to unfold what pride is and how deep it is and how pervasive it is. And the more that I read, the more it was as if these curtains were being pulled back and I was overwhelmed, realizing even as a new Christian, I got a major, major problem going on inside me with what I think, how I act on those thoughts, what I do from there. And I remember reading this in my dorm room and actually beginning to sweat since the sense of overwhelm, overwhelming weight of the sin and burden. C.S. Lewis explains that pride is not just being proud because you are cleverer or prettier or wealthier. It's thinking that you're cleverer, cleverer, prettier, or wealthier than everyone else. When we become aware of pride, we discover how much we love ourselves more than anything or anyone else. And at the root of it, here's the problem, we love ourselves more than God. And that's why Lewis calls pride the great sin and the root of all other sins. And so if you can begin to conquer and put to death the sin of pride, you're well on your way to conquering and putting to death any sin. So how can we escape this great sin, any sin, when it is everywhere? We know we're in Christ, but yet we still struggle with sin. We still fall into the same patterns. We're like the dog who returns to his own vomit, as the scriptures say. For as Lewis showed me to see ultimate greatness or ability in anything other than God is idolatry. That's the first step in understanding this. So in agreeing with C.S. Lewis and discovering that it was 
pride and the great sin is the root of all other sins. In those days, in my 20s, I wanted to find a way to conquer it. I had this overwhelming sense of a problem. I now needed a way to conquer it. And so from that moment until this day, I was greatly helped by my local church pastor, my professors, and the reading of good books, often very old books. From these, I found and discovered the most important discipline that I would learn in my 20s, and it is this. The ability the Christian has to conquer sin by remembering and reminding. The ability the Christian has to conquer sin, any sin, by remembering and reminding. Learning this discipline of remembering and reminding was and remains, as I say, one of the most life-giving and freeing experiences of my Christian life. For conquering the great sin and all other sins, all these things, putting them to death, allows you to grow in the knowledge of God. It frees you to see that which is worth treasuring and to abandon that which is really just foolishness and insanity. Conquering sin by remembering and reminding. In Ephesians 2, 11 through 13, these three verses is a wonderful passage to help us to grasp this discipline, remembering and reminding. Just to remind you, in Ephesians, Paul is in jail. He's writing to Ephesian believers with whom he had spent a great deal of time. And he's writing them to instruct and correct them, to, to help them. And in chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, we see him exalting and reminding them of God's grace toward them in salvation. Salvation. You read through the verses one through 10 and you realize there is no room for pride. There is really no room for any sin because we have received salvation entirely by God's grace. And so you'll notice here at the beginning of verse 11 that he starts off with the word, therefore, linking us back logically to verses one through 10 of chapter two. So then he can in verses 11 through 10 remind the Ephesians why their salvation is rooted in God's grace and begin to remind them of things that helps them to stand and to move forward and to conquer sin. Salvation is undeserved. So just to summarize as we begin, if you take anything away from the next few minutes, it's this. You can conquer any sin by regularly, number one, remembering who you were apart from Christ, and number two, reminding yourself of who you are in Christ. You can conquer any sin by remembering who you were apart from Christ and then reminding yourself who you were in Christ. And I mean doing that one time. I mean doing that every minute of every day. I mean doing that every day of every year for the rest of your life. If you remind yourself who you were apart from Christ and then remember who you were in Christ, you can conquer any sin. Conquer any sin and put it to death. So number one, we are to remember who we were apart from Christ, verses 11 and 12. Therefore, remember that at one time, he uses the word remember, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. One of my favorite characters in one of the greatest television shows of all time, it's a show that aired when many of you were in preschool and elementary school, but thanks to the miracle of Netflix, you can watch all seven seasons if you want uh, right now and relive the 1990s. It's called The West Wing. And one of my favorite characters in that show once said, presidential elections are won and lost on one square foot of real estate. Presidential elections are won and lost on one square foot of real estate. And this is a fictional quote from a fictional show, but there's still truth in the sentiment that one fair square foot of real estate being the mind of the candidate. Presidential elections are won and lost on one square foot of real estate, the mind of the candidate. And if this is true in the political world, it often true is, rings true in another sense for the believer in Christ. For we often live in our heads and sometimes we get trapped there and sometimes we get paralyzed there in this one square foot of real estate. The Christian life in many ways is won and lost, not ultimately because of Christ, but day-to-day -day battles are won and lost in one square foot of real estate, what we are doing internally in our heads. For some of you, depending on the sensitivity of your conscience, you often live paralyzed by what's happening in this one square foot of real estate. You're constantly evaluating, assessing, thinking, obsessing. You're remembering old sins. You're playing out alternate realities. You're constantly asking, well, what if this would have happened or what if I would have done this? And some of you don't have a sensitive enough conscience. 
You're losing the battle in one square foot of real estate because you're not doing these things enough. You're falling into other errors because you're simply just not thinking. You're making errors of judgment or foolishness or carelessness. The Christian life on a day-to-day basis is often lost in one square foot of real estate. Well, what Paul is doing here in verses 11 and 12 gives the Ephesians and the believers guidance to the right way to think, the right way to live in this one square foot of real estate. One early church father said of this very passage that Paul has already said that God has saved us when we were dead in sins and children of wrath. Now he is showing us to what extent God has raised us. He's helping the believer to think through what God has done on their behalf. So what is it we should remember about who we were apart from Christ? What's a healthy thing to think about? Paul gives the Ephesians six things briefly here. He says that they were once Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by the circumcision. They were called a name, the uncircumcision, by another group of people called the circumcision. They were not Jews, they were Gentiles. They were not part of ethnic Israel. They were people on the outside. Circumcision was a physical sign of the old covenant, a sign that they were a part of God's family. And the non-Jews did not have this sign and therefore were not a part of God's family. And so thus they were regularly called when they were apart from Christ, the uncircumcision. It was an odious term, it was a negative term, it was an insult. They were to remember that apart from Christ, they were on the outside. They were also to remember, number two, that they were separated from Christ. And separated from Christ simply meant that they were without all of his benefits. All of the blessings described in chapter two, verses one through 10, they did not have apart from Christ. Number three, they were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. Not only did they not have God's covenant sign, they were not a part of God's chosen people. They were not a part of the center of God's plan. They were not a part of the people into which God would send the Messiah to to spread his gospel to the ends of the earth. They were on the outside. They were separated from Christ. They were alienated. Number four, they were strangers to the covenant of promise. Genesis 12 talks about God's promise to build a great nation, to make a great name for himself. And they, they were strangers to this. They were not a part of this. You can feel the weight of it. Number five, they had no hope. They ultimately had no hope because they had no hope for freedom from sin. They had no hope. All of these things I'm about to tell you were true about them, but there was actually no hope to go along with it. Isaiah 53, six, six all, of, all we like sheep have gone astray. Jeremiah 17, nine, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Romans 3.10, there is no one righteous. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Ephesians 2.1, just above this, you were dead in your trespasses and your sins. Apart from Christ, all of this is true. Dead, sick, deceitful, sinful, no hope. They're to remember this. And then finally, number six, they're to remember that they were without God in the world. Perhaps the greatest tragedy of it all. It's one thing to not be a part of God's people. It's another thing not to have God at all. They were without God in the world. So not only is this true of the Ephesians believers before they came to Christ, it's also entirely true of us. And this is what we are to remember on our way to conquering sin. The first step in conquering sin is to remind yourself of who you were apart from Christ, to remember what you deserved and to remind yourself what you did not have. You were aliens, you were strangers, you had deceitful and sick sick hearts, you were without hope, you were without God. That is who you were apart from Christ. Remember this. Remember that before Christ, you didn't have all these things and now in Christ, you do have them. And it's a stark reminder to us too, not only just to be thinking of ourselves, that in the world, remember, there are just two kinds of people. There are those who have Christ and those who do not have Christ. And those who do not have Christ are in, this, are in this boat. They're without hope. They're without God in the world. We were just like them. That's who they are. And that's what they need more than anything else. So if all this is true in the grandest sense, in the sense that we deserved it, that is what we deserved, how can we even begin to boast, to engage in pride or any other sin and in the simplest and smallest of ways? When you return to this sort of baseline understanding, remembering who you were apart from Christ, it should humble you. It should wake you up. It should snap you out of the insanity that is sin that you're considering doing or that you're struggling with to realize who you were apart from Christ. To conquer sin, we have to first remember who we were and remember what we deserved.
You may remember the story in Luke 18 of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Jesus told a parable about those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. And lest you think that that's not you, it was actually all of us at one time, trusting in ourselves as though we were righteous until we trusted Christ. Two men went up to the temple to pray, the Pharisee who's perceived by the listeners as being the righteous one and the tax collector who's perceived by the listeners as being the sinner, the unrighteous one. The Pharisee goes over and stands by himself. He's standing. He's a posture of self-reliance. He's saying something that I'm able to stand here and to pray. I'm going to be an example. And he says, God, I thank you. I'm not like the other men, even this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I, 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 I'm, I'm doing all these things. But look at the tax collector's posture. The text says he's standing far off. He would not lift his eyes to heaven. He beats his chest instead of standing upright. And he says, God, be merciful to me, a sitter, sinner. Jesus said it was the tax collector who returned justified from that scene. He's the one who humbled himself and did not exalt himself. And the warning there is that he who exalts himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be exalted. We need to remember who we were apart from Christ, to remember our posture, and that should change our posture so that when we come to Christ, we're not standing proud on our own self-reliance, but rather bending down and remembering who we were. But this part, this remembering, doesn't really sound all that great. It doesn't sound all that joyful. If we're honest, this kind of introspection, this is what we're doing, we're thinking about ourselves, doesn't really seem like it will help us actually see victory and conquer our one square foot of real estate, to conquer what's going on in our minds. You might even ask, isn't it sort of unhealthy introspection to focus on who we were and who we used to be? Should we really spend time dwelling on this? Well, to be sure, there is a danger here. Introspection is not enough. To put it another way, introspection without crucifixion leads to mental paralysis at best. And even more, it can lead to pride at worst. Introspection without crucifixion leads to mental paralysis at best. At worst, it can lead to even more sin because of the hopelessness with which you can find yourself. Healthy remembering, what Paul's instructing the Ephesians to do and therefore instructing us to do is not destructive introspection. It's not just bringing up specific sins or your state status without God in the past to beat yourself up with. It's just an honest recognition of who you were and what you needed. It's looking in the mirror of, of who you were. It's a humble reminder of where we came from and what we deserved apart from the grace of God. But it's not dwelling there. That's the key. It's not dwelling there. When we do this type of remembering and doing it in a healthy way, we're on our way toward practicing this discipline of conquering sin. But that only takes us halfway. And if we stop there, we will be hopeless. So we need to do number two. We are to remind ourselves who we are in Christ. Verse 13, we're to remind ourselves who we are in Christ. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We've talked about what we are to remember. Now Paul's gonna help us see what we are to remind ourselves. In Trip Lee's book, came out in 2015, Rise, Get Up and Live in God's Great Story, Trip Lee talks about something he calls 7 a.m. logic, 7 a.m. logic. Now, Tripoli is not a morning person, something to which I can relate a great deal. Um, all my friends, as they've aged, have all become morning people. My parents are morning people. My wife and I, hasn't happened. And uh, we're still living life like we were living in college. I get more done at 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. than I ever do waking up early. And uh, so I can relate to Tripoli. And what he explains is that for him to get up in the morning for anything, he has to set about 16 different alarms just to ensure that he'll get out of bed. And just to show you that I'm just like him, this morning in order to get over here, I think I have three alarms. One, I switch from Central Time to Eastern Time. You know, I'm just doing the best I can to make sure I get up and, and I'm alert and able to speak in a coherent sentence in the morning. So Tripoli e says that in that fight between alarms, you know, one will go off, he'll hit snooze, then the other one comes, he'll, he's doing all these things. He says he wrestles with what he calls 7 a.m. logic. He's saying, sometimes I think I could convince myself of anything in those first drowsy minutes of each morning. What seemed plausible in bed at 7 a.m., he says, usually makes no sense by 7.30 a.m., but 7 a.m. logic can be deceptive even though it's entirely faulty. 
So what he has to do to avoid this trap is to remind himself what is real and to get out of bed and to get on with the day. Lots of times at that 7 a.m. misty cloud, you can be thinking a lot of things, and the most healthy thing you can do is actually just to get up out of bed and get going and let the thoughts sort themselves out as you go along. This is, in some ways, describes exactly the battle we face with sin every day of our lives. Sin and temptation can come, and we can get trapped into thinking and rationalizing how this might make sense, or how I won't get caught, or how, how that's not really that bad, or I've seen this, and you get in this whole 7 a.m. logic, this miss you can convince yourself, and the thing to do is to forget that, forget the logic, and just move on toward what you know is right and let the thoughts sort out themselves. The key to conquering sin is not only to remember who we were apart from Christ to bring humility to reorient our perspective, but simultaneously reminding ourselves of what is true about who we are. Remembering and reminding us helps us to snap out of the 7 a.m. logic. You cannot combat sin and even what's going on in the one square foot of real estate in your mind without something external coming in. You have to take thoughts captive and counteract the thoughts inside your own mind. What's going on naturally inside your own mind in the flesh is contrary to what's going on in the spirit. And so you have to combat it. And the way you can do that is by reminding yourself who you were apart from Christ and then regularly bombarding your mind, reminding yourself who you are in Christ. You have to go on the offensive to snap out of what temptations and sin are coming. So we see here in verse 13, Paul begins with the phrase, but now. But now, this is a declaration of the present to them. Now, at the present time, everything that follows is true. Remember who you were apart from Christ, but now, at the present time, everything that follows is true. You once were far off, but now you've been brought near by the blood of Christ. And in this sense, this phrase, but now, is one of the most beautiful phrases in all of the New Testament. You were once strangers, aliens, hopeless, but now, everything else is true. Now, at the present time, you've been brought near by the blood of Christ. For some of you today, this may be the only thing you need to hear. But now the text is declaring about you. Now this is true. You've been bought near by the blood of Christ. No matter what's been happening in your mind or in your heart or how you're thinking through things in Christ, but now you've been brought near by the blood of Christ. You've been set free by the blood of Christ. Remind yourself, speak to yourself, preach to yourself what is true about you right now. But now you've been brought near by the blood of Christ. Correct bad thoughts with right thoughts. Control the one square foot of real estate and live and see sin conquered. In Christ Jesus, but now in Christ Jesus. This is a key phrase for Ephesians, the core of his reminder, and it makes all the difference for conquering sin. This isn't just some self-help talk, take control of your brain. No, reminding yourself what's true is that, but now you're in Christ Jesus. It makes all the difference for conquering sin. Christ Jesus makes all the difference for conquering sin. He says, you were once far off, just as we explained above, Gentiles outside of the covenant, but now you've been brought near. You've been grafted into the new covenant, he's explaining. You've been given a new heart, a new spirit dwells within you. And in some ways, he's unpacking the mystery that was hidden in the Old Testament, now revealed in the New Testament. He's talking about Ezekiel 36, where the prophecy is, is that at one day, I will give you a new heart. 2 Corinthians 3, 6, Paul says, God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, of, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Galatians 3.25 talks about the relationship of the law to the Spirit. Now that faith has come, we're no longer under the guardian, the law. We've been grafted into this new covenant. Romans 2 talks about this as the circumcision of the heart. Remember, he's talking about you were at one time called the uncircumcision by the circumcision party. I'm obliterating all that by telling you, you actually now are the true circumcision because you've been circumcised in the heart. You've been given the new covenant. But now, now at the present time, in Christ Jesus, you who are once far off, actually positionally are in Christ. You've been brought near by the blood of Christ. For no one is a Jew, no one's a part of God's people, he's saying, who is merely one outwardly or genetically. Circumcision, no matter what you may have received physically, he's saying, doesn't matter. A true, per, a true child of God is one who's one inwardly. Circumcision, the new covenant, is something the Spirit engrafts in you by the heart. This isn't just theology. This isn't just doctrine. These are the things that you should be bombarding your brain with at 7 a.m. when you're not sure what's going to go on in the day. These are the things you should be bombarding your mind with when faced with a temptation or with some faulty system or worldview. Bombarding your mind with, but now in Christ Jesus, you were once far off, you've now been brought near by the blood of Christ. Now that phrase, by the blood of Christ, is something that 
we should proclaim and herald and again, even just in our own minds, pour into and beat ourselves over with over and over again. The enemy would love for us to forget about the blood of Christ. The enemy would love for us to be embarrassed of the blood of Christ. The world would rather us not talk about the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ explains that Jesus Christ offered the perfect sacrifice for our sins. A perfect sacrifice that was costly and bloody. We often shy away about talking about the blood of Christ. We don't often sing about it in the songs that we sing, but it's the blood of Christ. It's Christ's blood that God requires to forgive sins. Hebrews 9, for if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more would the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from the dead works to serve the living God. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, knowing that you were ransomed from feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. And then here, even in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, in Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us and all wisdom and insight. Ephesians 2, 13 tells us, just this one verse, that for anyone in Christ Jesus, God the Father no longer sees them, but sees Christ. If you're in Christ Jesus, God the Father no longer sees you, he sees Christ. He no longer sees your sin, he sees Christ's righteousness as a payment for your sin. The blood of Christ covers you like a robe, like a perfect garment, like the Passover requirement before the Passover happened. The blood of Christ covers you. When God the Father looks at you, he sees Christ's imputed righteousness on your account, in your bank. He looks at you and sees Christ Jesus. But now, those of you who were once far off in Christ Jesus have been brought near by the blood of Christ. These are the things you need to be bombarding your brain with. The blood of Christ has covered all of my sin. Regardless of what's being, what I'm getting trapped up in my head, Christ Jesus has, a, has perfect, perfectly paid for my sin. We need to be reminding ourselves that we had nothing before Christ, and in Christ, we have nothing but Christ. We're not standing on our own two feet. We need to remind ourselves that we had nothing before Christ, and in Christ, we have nothing but Christ. It's all about Jesus Christ, bombarding ourselves, filling our minds with not just even thoughts, but now you're getting at what I'm, what I'm saying here, the person and work of Jesus Christ himself. The way to conquer sin is reminding yourself who you were apart from Christ and remembering who you are in Christ and coming face to face with Jesus Christ himself through his word and seeing that transform your life. A day-to-day -day relationship with Jesus Christ, having him walk along with you to fight sin is the way in which we conquer sin. So if we've learned this discipline of conquering sin is by remembering and reminding, how do we put it into practice? Real quickly, just a couple things. First thing is just a simple question, which I know you hear a lot, and there's a lot of things in your life and patterns here that are wonderful and great to aid you in this, but just an honest, introspective question for you. How connected are you to the Bible? Truly, how connected are you to the Bible? On the road to Emmaus, the disciples were helped when they remembered, it says, Jesus' words. He talks to them, he leaves, and then it says they remembered his words. John 16, four explains that while on earth, Jesus spoke in such a way that his disciples would remember his words when they would need them the most. The Bible tells us to let the word of God in Colossians three dwell in us richly. The Bible tells us that faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of Christ in Romans 10. The very best way to control this one square foot of real estate, what's going on internally in your mind, is to be flooding it with the very words of Christ himself the Bible, and not just flooding it, but clinging to it and standing upon it and building your life around it and letting it control your thoughts and actions and quoting it and memorizing it and bleeding it everywhere you go. How connected are you to the Bible? The Bible will help you to conquer sin by reminding yourself of who you were apart from Christ and reminding you of who you are in Christ. How do we put, else put this into practice? We have to battle daily for victory in this one square foot in, of real estate. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, we destroy arguments and every lofted opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. 
This means not living in introspection only, but moving from introspection to crucifixion of thoughts and sins. It's not just beating around and flailing around, it's actually putting those thoughts to death actively, putting them to death. This means right-sizing thoughts about ourselves, having a minimized view of ourselves and a maximized view of God. And it also means stop thinking about yourself at all. Introspection, reminding yourself who you're apart from Christ, reminding yourself in Christ, and then begin thinking of others as being more important than yourselves. Simply quit thinking about yourself and you'll move forward in putting sin to death. And then finally, and perhaps most importantly, this task of conquering sin, reminding and remembering, can't be done on your own. We're to live, learn, and conquer with the body of Christ. This is one of the beautiful things about the practice of the Lord's Supper in the local church. It is what? It's an ordinance of remembrance. Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. And what are you to be doing when you're participating in the Lord's Supper as a gathered body? You're to remember who you were apart from Christ. And you're to be reminding yourself who you are in Christ. You're to be doing that collectively. And you're to be examining yourself, doing this healthy introspection, and you will be putting sin to death. The regular practice of the ordinances of the local church are one of the very best things that can come alongside you to conquer sin. Don't feel like the battle and the walking, the Christian life is an isolated thing. It's meant to be lived out in community in the local church, regularly reminding and remembering with God's people, stirring up one another to conquer sin. We can conquer sin when we remember who we are apart from Christ and remind ourselves who we are in Christ with the body of Christ. Well, what began that day in my small little dorm room reading Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis moved through a conviction of the Holy Spirit and it led eventually to me discovering the most important discipline I would learn in my 20s, conquering sin by remembering and reminding. And this has been now 20 something years, one of the most painful, helpful, journeys of refining, breaking, humbling, but yes, hear me, victory, freedom, joy, growth in putting sin to death and growing in the knowledge of God as a result. So as we conclude today, I simply just invite you, break out of the 7 a.m. logic, combat this one square foot of real estate with the truth of who you are in Christ, reminding yourself who you are apart from Christ. See victory in sin all for his glory and his great name. Let's pray together. Father, you're an incredible, incredible God and so very, very kind to us. You don't just save us and justify us and put us positionally where we need to be in Christ. You have fellowship with us. You walk with us by the power of the Holy Spirit. You come alongside us. You care about what's going on inside of our brains. And you endeavor to help us by your word, by the spirit, by God's people. And I pray you would do that great work even more in us today and then help us to do it again tomorrow until you come. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.